hand clap of praise. Yes, come on. All right, 11 o'clock crowd, here's the deal, man. I've already preached twice today, so you guys have got to support me. And if, how many of you are glad that you're here at the lake? I want to hear a good shout of praise today. Come on, you guys. There you go. Man, that keeps me going, man. I'm telling you right now. So uh, we're so happy to hear. You know, I was thinking, when Danny told me that story, I said, that is the closest thing that you could ever get to of being in Santa's sleigh and flying over the houses. I mean, that is really, really cool. And we're, so we're glad that you're here. Several have been asking about the Israel trip that's coming up in March of 2021. Uh, we have some brochures on that. I brought a bunch of them this morning. They're all gone, uh, but we'll have some more uh, next week. And I'll give you some information on that. Dr. Chris and myself uh, are going to be heading that up along with uh, a pastor up in Raleigh. And uh, so that's March of 2021. And you want to the Bible to come alive. Only 55 people can go, and we got three churches getting 55 people. That's going to go fast. So anyway, we're glad that you're here, and praise the Lord. We're in the series called Over the River and Through the Woods, and it's about the journey to Christmas. Uh, and so Christmas was a journey. Now, uh, you know, it's kind of on the premise of many of us can remember that on Christmas morning or sometime during Christmas that you get in the car, you go to, your, you know, you go to your parents' house, you go to, you know, you go to family and all of that. And and, uh, and, and I have personal, I have personal, uh, really joyful memories of doing all that. Uh, and so we're saying, you know, the Christmas message, the Christmas story is a journey uh, to Christmas. There's a whole lot of over the river and through the woods to get uh, to Bethlehem. Uh, and we talked about this last week. We said the, uh, the message of Christmas, it really is all about anticipation. Uh, all the way back from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, man fell, Adam and Eve fell, sin came into the world. And God comes to them and says, listen, you blew it. And uh, there's all kinds of things that you lost because of sin. Death has come upon you because of sin. But I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to send someone that's going to come and buy back for you everything that you lost in the fall. Now, that's when Christmas started. That's the first prophecy of Christmas. So all of a sudden, it began. Uh, and it had to have a beginning. Every journey has a beginning. But it took 4,000 years, around 4,000 years there, before that ever take place, before Jesus being uh, born in Bethlehem ever uh, took place. Now, uh, we too live in anticipation of Christmas. And I know you're saying, yeah, yeah, man, you know, December 25th is coming before you. Know, I'm not talking about that. Uh, we too are living living in a time where we are anticipating. You see, we, we, try, we, we tend to think that after December 25th, Christmas is over for this year. And, uh, you know, we'll put, you know, the tree up and little baby Jesus back in his box or whatever, and Christmas is over. But nothing could be further from the truth than that because we're still living the Christmas message. We too are living in anticipation, not of Christ's coming. He's already come, but we live in anticipation of his second coming. Am I talking to anybody here today that believes Jesus Jesus is coming again. Let me hear from you today, all right? And, and he is coming again. Yes, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that because that's absolutely true. He is coming again. And just, matter of fact, more prophecies about his second coming than ever was his first coming. If Jesus ever came the first time, and certainly he did, we know that, that he's coming again. So we have this anticipation of Christmas, and we've always, we've always had that. So Christmas had to get started. Well, last time we talked about getting ready to go. Now today we're going to talk about along the journey, uh, along our, we're on our way. We're, we're going over the river. We're through the woods. We're headed home and we're on our way. And Christmas really started. We really got on our way when the angel Gabriel made an announcement to a young teenage girl. And I'm uh, personally, I believe she was around 14 years old. Uh, who lived in the hill country, uh, really in a hick town on the mountain called Nazareth. And uh, so he comes to that girl, and that's when we really get on our way over the river and through the woods and make our way uh, to Christmas. Now, before we get into that, how many of you ever started out on a trip, really excited about what you're getting ready to do, and something, you got derailed along the way? Something happened that just kind of ruined your trip. Anybody ever, anybody ever done that, okay? Uh, I think we all can identify with that. Here, here's, here's, here's something that happened to me. Uh, two weeks ago, we, uh, we, we have so many Christmas decorations. My, my wife, bless her heart, she loves Christmas. She's a decorator. And so uh, we, we have a storage unit that we have keep, keep Christmas decorations in. We, we have so many Christmas decorations, we can't even put them in our house. 
So we go to the storage unit, and we're getting our Christmas decorations out. And I'm looking at these things, man. I get excited. I'm a Christmas guy, by, by the way. And, uh, and I'm working on looking like Santa. But anyway, so, 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 you know, I'm excited. We got all these Christmas decorations and I got the music playing, you know, and, and I'm in my, uh, my old, uh, my old navigator, my Lincoln navigator. And, and, and it's full of Christmas stuff. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm listening to, you know, 96.5 Bob radio, you know, and I'm saying, you know, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I mean, Thank you. I'll be here all day. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I'm singing that. You know, I'm a nerd. I don't care. I sing Christmas songs out loud. And, uh, and by the way, I, I, I love that one you guys did, man. It's do up. I like that one. Anyway, so, so I'm, I'm all in the Christmas mood. Then I realized there's a couple of things that I, that I needed to throw away uh, that I need to get rid of on, on the way to back to the house. And I just live right across the street. And so we were coming. And I thought, man, where am I going to get rid of Then I realized, oh, I got a key to the uh to the to the dumpster out here at the church because i'm the pastor but anyway so 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 i said well i can i can i can go to the dumpster and you know so i have a key and I open it up and i and i move the gate out of the way it has a big pole there and you put it in the ground and so i do the lift gate on my navigator and i get out and i go whoa, whoa, whoa man I, I can get closer that's too far to walk I, I got about 10 steps i can save that's the way i roll so I get back in the navigator. I forget that the tail, the lift gate is up. I'm looking through my rear view mirrors and I'm backing up. And next thing I know, boom, I've demolished the lift gate on that navigator. It looks like this. I'm telling you, man. So, so Brent, Brent was here, him and his dad, him and Rick, they were decorating these trees and I knew Brent was in here. So I get on my cell phone. I said, Brent, help. He said, what'd you do? I said, come out here and check it out. He goes out there and he said, oh man. I said, Brent, how much do you think that's going to be? Because by the way, I don't have collision on that car because it's old. It's got over 200,000 miles on it. So we decided last year, ah, eh, we don't need collision on that car. I said, Brent, come on, man. How much you think? How much you think? He said, Pastor, you're looking anywhere between $2,000 and $3,000 to get that fixed. Merry Christmas to me. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, you got insurance on it, right? I said, <clears throat> nope. He said, well, Merry Christmas to you then. And so, so here I am, you know, no Christmas. I'm not singing. It's beginning to look a lot. I'm not singing. I'm singing. It's beginning to look a lot like bankruptcy. But anyway, so, so, you know, so, so, so I, I, I'm feeling bad. Well, I know the one person I can go to because I'm, I'm feeling like such an idiot that I would do that just to save 10 steps. And so I'm feeling so, I'm down. So I know, I'll go to the one person, the love of my life, the one person I can get encouragement out of. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all way ahead of me, man. <laughs> and so I call her. I took that picture, well, that picture you saw, and I sent it to her and I said, look what I did. And I'm thinking she's gonna text me back and say, well, sweetheart, baby, that's." That's how we talk to each other. And, she, and I thought she was going to say, well, honey, it could happen to anybody. No, the text message I get back, it says, you're such an idiot. Anyway, so, so, so anyway, so, so, so you, know, you, you, you know, you're in the mood, you're, you're going somewhere, you know, and all that. And then, boom, something happens. Well, that's life. That happens. But that's nothing compared to what happened to a 14-year-old girl or a teenage girl up in Nazareth. You see, she's engaged. She's engaged to be married. Now, and so this is a happy thing. She has plans for her life. Uh, and I know what you think. You say, yeah, well, that was an arranged marriage. Well, who said arranged marriages were bad? Kind of wish we'd practice those in this country. But anyway, so, so nobody, said, nobody said just because they're raised, they didn't love each other. I believe Mary loved Joseph. Joseph loved Mary. I believe that with all my heart. So here she is. I've never met a young girl that's got engaged to be married, that doesn't have plans, doesn't have excitement. She's going to set up a house and all of those kind of things. And in the midst of her excitement, in the midst of her hopes and her dreams with her new husband and all of that, then her world gets rocked everything in her life in one swoop moment changes everything 
Let's, let's look at it. Everybody take your Bible and turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke and uh, chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke chapter 1, and we're going to be reading verses 26 through 34. Now, I'm going to read this out of the New Living Testament. Uh, not that I think it's, uh, you know, theologically or that I think it's more in-depth, uh, you know, translation. Uh, but I, I do like the way it reads, especially when you're reading a story. I like the way it reads. So uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 34. This is out of the New Living Testament. And if you have a, uh, you know, if you have a Bible, you can, you can get that on your online. You can switch it over to New Living, the NLT uh, or not. You can look on the screen. Uh, Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Let's all stand uh, out of respect and honor uh, to, to just kind of remember remind us that this ain't my word, this ain't the church word, this ain't Baptist word. How many of you say amen? This is God's word. And we're getting ready to read. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, now let's just stop right there. Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. Six months earlier, an angel had come to Elizabeth and said, you're going to have a baby. She was well past childbearing age, and she does have a baby, and we know that baby as none other than John the Baptist. So they're cousins, all right? So God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph and a descendant of King David. Now Gabriel appeared to her and he said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And so obviously the angel sees this look on her face and he says, Don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll call him Jesus, and he'll be very great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, Father, thank you, Lord, for the Christmas story. Lord, we read it a hundred times. Lord, this is, this is the 30th year I have preached a Christmas message in this church. But Father, there's always something fresh and new because that's what your word does. Your word is a living word. We can never exhaust it. So show us new, wonderful, fresh things, insights, Lord, to our life that we may apply it to our life. It's one thing to hear the word, but it's a whole other thing to apply it to our life. So thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen. Now you may be seated. Now we love this part of the Christmas story. Uh, it's sweet. It's tender. It's Mary. Uh, she's a virgin. She's a young girl. And everything kind of fits. You see, as believers, we believe this. As believers, we believe in angels. As believers, we, we believe that God has a power uh, to, uh, to have a, a, a cause a virgin to, be, to become pregnant. We, we believe all that. And so for us, it fits. And for us, you know, with our Christmas scenes that we have in our house, and also kind of, you know, thankful to some 14th century artists. Everything seems so holy. Everything seems so clean. Everything seems so organized. But it was not anything like that on that first Christmas. And especially in Mary's life. Uh, I want you to notice, look at Mary's reaction at first. Look at verse 29. Confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. And the angel saw this on her face and said, don't be afraid, Mary. And I want you to, 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 to note that word afraid there. Underline that word afraid there. The Greek word for afraid here is phobeto. Uh, it's where we get our word phobia from. Uh, it literally means terrified. You see, this wasn't buttoned up. This wasn't clean. Uh, this wasn't as holy as we like to think it is. That our nativity seems, you know, with, with Mary with a halo over her head. She was absolutely terrified. She had a phobia about this. Now, if we all be honest, we all have phobias over something. I know, you know, everybody here is going, no, not me. I ain't scared of nothing. You tell that to somebody else. We all have something we're terrified over. We all have phobias in our life. Since it's confession time, I'll confess first. I am terrified of rats and mice. Can somebody say amen? amen. Anybody not afraid of rats and mice? Okay, some of you freaks, all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, you're bright. You are so, why didn't they fit you? You're in Braveheart. I don't know. But not me. They're so fast. They're, they're little, they're fast. And they're not cute. 
and that movie, Ratuli or whatever, you got these mice running all over food, that is not cool. Matter of fact, if I could get away with it, if they would just move Mickey Mouse, I wouldn't even go to Disney World. Feed that mouse. I thought, and I know what you said, well, I thought you were afraid of snakes. Well, snakes, I am, but if a snake eats a mouse, he's my BFF. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? I love a snake if he'll eat a mouse. Now, we all have something that we're, we're, we're afraid of. We all have something that we're terrified of. Uh, and so this announcement terrified her. Look at verse 34. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Now, automatically, the wheels are turning in Mary's head. She said, I live in a small town. I live in a small mountain town, and everybody knows everything about everybody else. And I am going to be the gossip around the well in Nazareth. Not only that, but when I make this announcement and I try to tell this story that nobody's going to believe, some of you even here today don't even believe it. Nobody's going to believe this. More than likely, my parents are going to disown me. Matter of fact, I don't know this for sure. And Maybe I'm way off track here. I don't, I don't see Mary's parents mentioned in this story. Maybe they did disown her. I don't know. But here's the thing. Engagement to Joseph was legal and binding. It's not like engagement today. You can get engaged today and things don't work out. You can throw the ring back or go hawk it and, you know, pawn it off, whatever. But the bottom line is, is that it was legal and binding. Now, they, they didn't live together. They were engaged. They were spoused uh, because Joseph was preparing the home for Mary, him and his dad. And so, uh, so here she's thinking, well, he, absolutely, he's going to divorce me. He's going to drop me like a hot potato. And I don't know how he's going to react with this, but according to the law, he could, if he wanted to, he could have me stoned. So her whole world, nobody's going to believe this. People to this day don't believe this. Nobody's going to believe this. So now she's terrified. She's, uh, she's scared of what's going to happen. Now, let me give you a couple of thoughts very quickly. I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. Say amen. Come on. Here's number one. And, and I want this to sink in. God doesn't always want us to be comfortable. Okay. Are, are y'all getting this? Young people, listen to me. Come on. Look at me. Because you need this. You're going to need this in your life. Uh, We all need this in our life. And I don't care how old you are. God doesn't always want you to be comfortable in life. You say, well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, God God wants me to be comfortable. No, no, no. There are times that God just absolutely doesn't want you to be comfortable in life. The, 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 you, you think about it, everything, for some reason we bought into this idea that if I, that if I know Jesus and I'm serving Jesus and I'm going to Jesus' church and, and, and I'm giving, you know, my time, my money to Jesus that he asked for and all that, that, then surely everything will fall into place and surely I'll be comfortable. Not all the time. Sometimes when you pray, I know you don't like to hear this, sometimes, how many of you know God will absolutely say no. No. Don't ask it. Talk about Paul. Ask Paul about that. Three times he had a thorn in the flesh. I don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. Personally, I think maybe he might have been legally blind after his stoning. I don't know. Could have been a message. Could have been somebody just absolutely distorting, trying to stop his ministry. But it was, it was something that was so dire in his life. He went to God three times and said, God, remove it, remove it, remove it. And God said, no, I'm not going to. But God, it's making me uncomfortable. God said, so? I was uncomfortable on the cross. Deal with it. Deal with it. And so sometimes God just doesn't want comfortable things happen to us. Now listen to me. Come on. Could it be? Could it be? Because we're always trying to pray our way out of uncomfortable things. Because we think that's God's will for our life. You know, God, I I don't have any money. Then God gives you some money. Well, God, I don't have enough money. Well, well, God, I'm I'm sick. I'm in pain. God heals that. But sickness and pain comes again. Well, God, I'd love to have a a, a spouse. I'd love to have a a husband. I'd love to have a wife that loves me. And God gives you that. And then 
A couple years later in our culture, God, I'd like to have another husband. I'd like to have another wife. I'd like to have another husband that ain't afraid of mice. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And so we go along, we keep going along, and we're trying to always pray ourselves out of uncomfortableness. And it could be that the thing that we're trying to pray our way out of could be the thing that God wants to use the most in our life. Think about that. The the thing that you spend so much time praying your way out of, and you say, God, I pray and I pray and I pray and nothing's happening. God said, I know it. My answer is no. But it could be because God loves you. God doesn't want you suffering. He He didn't want you terrified. But it could be that God has said, listen, this could be the thing that's going to make such a difference in your life. You don't see it now. But it can happen. And so Mary had to deal with that. So she had to come to grips with God didn't always want things to be comfortable. Look in verse 30. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now get that. This fearful, disturbing, terrifying situation that Mary found herself in is not because she wasn't in the will of God. It's because she was in the will of God. Uh, And God is teaching her. I don't always want you to be comfortable. I know it's uncomfortable. How are you going to explain this away? Nobody's going to believe you. But I got a will and a purpose. Number two, believing always precedes receiving. Now get that. Understand that. Believing always precedes receiving. So here's here's what I want you to notice. Here's an angel of God coming to Mary. And not just any angel. The angel Gabriel. As far as I know, only two angels mentioned by their first name in the Bible. One is Michael. Michael is the archangel. Michael is the the one that's kind of in charge of the armies of God, the angelic armies of God. And then we have Gabriel. And Gabriel seems to be the angel of prophecy. Matter of fact, back in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, God gives Daniel a vision. And Daniel doesn't understand it. So what does he do? He sends Gabriel down to Daniel to explain the prophecy. Luke chapter 1, Zacharias, he doesn't understand what God's trying to do. So God sends Gabriel to him to give an announcement. You're going to have a child, even though you're way past childbearing age. And so Daniel, I mean, Gabriel seems to be the the angel of prophecy. and, And so God sends this angel, the angel Gabriel to her, personally to her. And, uh, and so listen, listen to what he says in verse 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now she hasn't had sexual relations. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You'll call him Jesus. He's going to be very great. He'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever to his kingdom that will never come to the end. Now, what a promise. For 4,000 years, we've been waiting on that promise. For 4,000 years, we were told that Messiah is a man born of a woman. And for 700 years, Isaiah told us that that woman would be a virgin. Now, people have a problem with the virgin birth. That's why a lot of people, you invite them. That's why a lot of people don't darken the door of church. For that one reason, I can't believe that you people are so close-minded that you would believe hook, line, and sinker this story of a virgin. Uh, my, my, my undergraduate degree is in religion, university of North Carolina is Charlotte. And, uh, and every single professor I had in those four years of college, every single one of them in the religion department told me the word virgin doesn't mean what we think it means. It just, it just means it's a young woman of meritable age. No miracle of this at all. A young woman has a relationship with a young man. No miracle of that. Don't, you know, don't sweat it. That's what happened. The only one problem with that. Back in the book of Isaiah, God says, listen, you name it. Name the most impossible sign that you can think of that I will give you to let you know that that one is Messiah. Well, they couldn't think of one. They said, no, we're not going to do that. God said, okay, I'll give it to you. Here's an, here is an impossible sign. And in the book of Isaiah, he says, behold. Now, by the way, anytime the Bible says, behold, how many of you say amen? We need to behold. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now, the bottom line, if this is a young woman, have a relationship with a young man, have a baby, that's, a, that's not a behold. 
That's an everyday occurrence. My wife did it three times and all three times. And WRAL or Fox News never came to our hospital room and said, how did this happen? (laughs) Nobody ever did that. We know how it happened. You know how it happened. Some of you really know how it happened. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's an everyday occurrence. So this is a behold. We're talking about a literal virgin here. We're talking about somebody that's never, ever had a relationship with a man. And so he, he tells her this. So, so, so for 4,000 years, and Mary is that woman. We find out out of all the women that have ever been born and lived through all of these millenniums, you are that woman. And you would think she's just going to praise God all over the place. Now, she ends up doing that. But before she does that, she's got to wrap her arms. She's got to wrap her faith. She's got to, she's got to believe. She's got to, before she can receive the promise, she's got to believe the promise. Uh, look at verse 34. Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm just a virgin. By the way, by the way, you got a problem with the virgin birth? You ain't alone. Mary had a problem with the virgin birth. You got a problem believing in the virgin birth? You ain't alone. Mary had a problem believing in virgin birth. Matter of fact, she was the first one to say, how in the world can this be? Well, she asked Gabriel a question and he gives her an answer. I mean, God doesn't want you in the dark. He gives her, he gives her an answer. Uh, and, look, and look what his answer is. Uh, look at verse 35. He said, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Okay. That help? That make any sense? There's no way that made sense to Mary. She didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. Holy Spirit had not come and dwell people at this time. She didn't know. There's no way that she knew what he was talking about. Now listen to me, listen to me. Are you listening? Come on. Here's what I want you to see. You ask God, you want answers. That something may happen in your life and, and, and some things happen along the way as you're going over the river and through the woods and you want to say, God, why? Why is this happening? How can it, why would you allow? I need to know. And, and many times God will let you know, but it's still not enough. Still not enough. Uh, any, any, anybody have teenagers in the house? Okay. All right. And I'm not picking on teenagers. I love them. I used to be one. Uh, when, my, when my kids were teenagers, they, they'd come, Dad, can I go to this party? Uh, and I'd say, no. Well, why? And then I'd proceed to tell them why. They asked me why. And I told them why. I don't know this people. I don't know this kid. I don't know their house. I don't know what's going on over there. I love you. My job, my calling is to protect you. Your daddy loves you. And in this situation, no, you're not going. They asked me why. I told them why. End of story, right? You would think my kid would go, oh, hey, Father, that is wise. Thank you, oh, Father. Do you, hey, you guys over here, you think that's going to happen? No, you know what my kids say? The same thing you guys say. That's not fair. You ask me why? I told you why. A lot of times you go to God and say, God, why? And God says, this is why. Because I see where you don't see. I know what you don't know. I know it may be hurting you right now. And I know it may be confusing the mess out of you right now. But that is why this is happening. And we still walk away saying... That's not fair. So Gabriel gave her an answer. Holy Spirit of God will come upon you. God's going to overshadow you. He gave her an answer. But he could tell she didn't connect the dots. That's why ultimately he gave her the best answer. Look what he said in verse 37. For the word of God will never fail. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Have anybody that believes that today? Say a big amen. Amen. For with God, nothing is impossible. Listen, it comes down to that. God said, I can tell you why. I can, I can, I can give you all the reasons. I can give you all the explanations. But the bottom line is, 
When life gets derailed, when you uh, hit the lift gate on your old car, bottom line is, just trust God. You see, with you, it's impossible. With man, virgin birth, that's impossible. And we know that. And all the fuzzy-faced professors in the world know that. And they'll mock at that and they'll scoff at that. And you can put us in any kind of pigeonhole you want to, but it just all boils down that we believe God said it and God can do anything because he's God. Well, she, uh, verse 38, Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you said about me come true. Then the angel left her. How'd she get to that point? How did she get to the point where her life, her world was rocked, an uncertain future, everything she holds dear is probably going to be taken away from her as far as she knew. But she got to the point where she said, Gabriel, I don't understand it all, but may everything you said to me come true. How did she get there? She got there by one thing that Gabriel told her in the very beginning when he greeted her. And we already read it. He said, Mary, the Lord is with you. Is there anybody here today that needs to come to grips, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what your situation is, you need to come to grips that no matter what, the Lord is with you. And all God's people say, so you got to come to grips with that. Because before you can receive his promises, you got to believe his word. Would you bow your head, please? Every head bowed and every eye closed.